it's so important that we don't just sing songs, that we don't just mouth the words and enjoy the melodies as, as good as, as that is. But there's something underneath that. And when you connect the reality of God showing up in your own life and the lives of those around you, the way we're able to sing, they're declarations of faith. And they're able to not just, I'm going to say, be expressions of worship, but I believe that God, the scripture says, is enthroned on the praises of his people. It changes the atmosphere as it goes out, as God's actually present in the sound and expression. And you guys are, you know, atmosphere changers. You're world changers. You're transforming as you speak forth, I believe, this morning and just in general. So thank you. And thank you, God, for the goodness that we can not just sing about, but declare the reality of that in our own lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, you know, this morning we're bringing to a conclusion um, our so long series on the claim. And we've been taking all these weeks and these months to kind of challenge ourselves, asking ourselves, how do we hold our crown? How do we hold the life, the God-given stuff, our skills, our talents, our finances, everything that we have before God. And what can we learn from the Old Testament examples of the kings and queens that are, are there? And there's been a lot said and a lot taught, but this morning we bring that to a conclusion. And I trust that, that as, as, as we do, that if there's one thing that you've learned, if there's one thing that's really been impressed on you with all the various ways it's been expressed, is that no matter how much acclaim and fame, whether it be Saul or David or Solomon or Rehoboam, or Hezekiah, all different kings, Esther, etc., that they achieved, no matter how many buildings they built, how much land they conquered, how much <coughs> fortune they amassed, all their legacy ultimately was not built upon any of those things. But the legacy of their crown was found in how they chose to relate to the King of Kings. And therefore, the legacy that you have and the legacy that, that we're challenged with is how do you hold your crown? What's the legacy that will be written about you regarding the way that you stewarded your responsibilities, your gifts, your talents, your life, in a way that that doesn't just say, wow, did that, that person have a lot of fun and a lot of money and a lot of cool stuff? Because all that stuff is, in the end, it's meaningless. But how did they love God and how did they love others? How was Christ manifested in the way that they chose to carry themselves in the hard times or in the good times? You know, as, this comes to a, as, as it comes to an end, the, the reality is when you get to the very end of the book, <laughs> we get out of the Old Testament, get to the New Testament, flip to the very end, it's really clear what the Apostle John wrote. Familiar words to a lot of us. That is, is the Lord was showing him the reality of what was to come. And he revealed who Jesus was. And in Revelation chapter 19, all of a sudden he said, and I saw the heavens were open. Well, when the heavens open, what do you see? When God decides to reveal himself and what's going on in his realm in a way that we cannot often see, he said, behold, wow, look what I see. I see a white horse. And he who sat upon it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages wars. And in his eyes is a flame of fire. And his head, many diadems, a huge crown and his name is called the word of God and on his robe and on his thigh he has also a name written it's the king of kings and the lord of lords Jesus if the heavens were open and we saw it for what it really is and how it really is the reality of his rulership over every king in other words over all of our crowns John sees and goes wow Look at how it ends. Look at where we're going. Look at the reality of our reality. So get past 
this earthen, as great as it is, and I'm so grateful. Like I said, I love this courtyard. I love being with you. I love looking at you and fellowshipping with you. But if, as the heavens open up and as our spirits begin to enlarge, the reality of who Christ is for us, he holds our crowns and he holds your life. And the legacy that he's asking us in these days, and especially in these days where it's craziness, man, all the time, right? Walk the streets, look in a bush, right? It's just everywhere. That there's, that there's a king who reigns over all. And our ability as a people of faith, as believers in Jesus, to walk with that sense of confidence and assurance there is a king and there is a Lord and he rules over it all. And I'm speaking that out and claiming authority. Let me help you claim that authority over your life and the difference you can make. I'm excited about the days ahead, as crazy as it is, because God's got great things for himself and through you. Amen? May the heavens open, and may we see it for what it really is. And may we, like the Apostle John, find ourselves just jaw-dropped and in awe that ultimately every king and every lord, including us, will submit to that king of kings. And the legacy that we live is the legacy that really counts and how we loved and worship God. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, part of that is rejoicing in the legacy that we have as a people and walking in the gifts that we have. And one of the gifts that we are blessed with as a people is, is Barney and Linda and their family. And so, just so that you know, yeah, all the votes were in, and there was basically it's all unanimous, as if we needed to know that, right? <laughs> That's what it is. So, it's just, so, yeah, Barney, it's a no. No. <laughs> Not like that. Oh. Yeah, us together, unanimously, you know, in, in Acts it talks about as they were praying together about the future of two leaders, Paul and Barnabas, they came to a place in the context of their fellowship together, saying it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit to set aside Paul and Barnabas to go out on a mission. I think in the same sort of spiritual vein, together we're agreeing that Barnabas that's sitting here before us, that um, for such a time as this, that God sovereignly chose you to be here. And um, I just want to testify for a moment and just say what I think we all really already know, is that God's given us a shepherd who cares for people. That God's given us yeah. men. That God in his wisdom through all the many years that he's an experienced man who's walked with faithfulness and integrity. He loves his family. He loves his wife. And I know he loves us. I sense, you know, your care and your love for me. And I know that, that the gifts that you have and the gifts that you carry are not for yourself. That you're willing to give it however you can. And that we're all the recipients of that. And I would ask us now as we chose that way and voted that way, that likewise we would encourage this brother and stand with this brother to be in a place of leadership in the church. It's a big responsibility. There's a lot of warfare regarding that. It happens all the time. We know that, right? If you can take down leadership, churches are falling down across America because the leadership at times is falling apart. God protect us. God protect Barney to stand with strength and integrity, with faithfulness and grace for the days that are ahead of you. We need what God has given to you. I need to have that gift come forth in your teaching, in your preaching, in your counseling, in your shepherding. The elders are called to shepherd and to overtend, to guard all of the shop, right? Us. So here we are, and we have an opportunity to stand in unity and to receive what it is that God has in you as a leader. Barnum, why don't you come up and share it Let's bless him as he comes in. Thank you. Linda, you want to say anything? <laughs> you go first. Okay. No, I don't like her having the last word. <laughs> Love you guys. Thank you, Steve. Those are very humbling uh, thoughts, and I appreciate Somebody say Mad Dog. That's my nickname in Crossing the Jordan. I don't know. It's just such a, okay, all right. So I encourage you guys. Um, 
You know, four years ago, thank you guys. I, I do appreciate the vote of confidence. I kind of had to know which way it went, and so thank you for that. And um, let me just pray. Father, just thank you this, this, this morning for this wonderful opportunity to serve this amazing group of people in, in a new way, in a different way, in some ways, Lord. And God, I just pray uh, a blessing over each and every person that's here, Lord, and I just pray for wisdom. Um, I can really relate to Solomon when he said, I'm, I'm like a child, I don't know what to do sometimes. And so, God, I just pray, not only for me, but for all the elders, all our leaders and shepherds, Lord, for a spirit of wisdom to come upon us in a deeper way. And we just thank you for Jesus, who is our chief shepherd. And uh, we worship you today, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, it was four years ago, four years and a couple of months, that Linda and I stood on this very spot right here in the courtyard, and you welcomed us as a part of SRCC, and uh, you have walked with us uh, over the past four years as we, we begin this new chapter, and it's been just a time of real blessing for us. Um, but before I move ahead, I, I really want to acknowledge the past, those that have gone before us, specifically Ken and Connie Wehmeyer, it was a month ago that we honored them as Ken retired as one of our elders for, uh, as he served for 50 years. And I, I'm not, I know they're here today somewhere, but let's just, uh, there you are, right? Um, let's acknowledge Ken and Connie and uh, uh, appreciation that they and, and they've been a huge part of the church here. The church has such a rich history uh, founded 164 years ago. And that's amazing. When you really think about uh, how many churches can survive that long, what that really shows is there's an openness. And, and I, we need to be thankful for that heritage that we've had as Santa Rosa Christian Church. But I recognize in the church here that we're also not bound to the traditions of the past. And that's why we survived. Not just survived, but thrived. For 164 years because we've been willing to embrace new ideas and there is an openness now to the future ahead now before we go any further I want to read to you from 1st Peter chapter 5 because this is uh, uh, Peter's instruction to to the elders of the church he says now I encourage you as an elder an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ and one who shares in the glory that is about to be unveiled I urge my fellow elders among you to be compassionate shepherds who tenderly care for God's flock and who feed them well, for you have the responsibility to guide, protect, and oversee. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but there's three words that are used in here that I especially want to note. He refers to the leaders of the church as elders. They are, are men of experience. Secondly, he refers to them as, as shepherds because this is what they do or, or how they do this is is it, really that was a metaphor that was very familiar to the ancient world because it involved tenderness and compassion. But he also says we're overseers. And the, the, the word overseer there literally means a watchman on the wall. It was a man who stood on the wall of a city and he would watch the horizon to see if enemies were coming. And that's a huge responsibility because if he kind of fell asleep on the job, the city would be overtaken. And so I, I'm honored to join this group of godly men and serve as an elder, a shepherd, and an overseer of the flock. Now, he continues and says, Consider it a joyous pleasure and not merely a religious duty. Lead from the heart under God's leadership, not as a way to gain finances dishonestly, but as a way to eagerly and cheerfully serve. Don't be controlling tyrants, but lead others by your beautiful examples to the flock. And when the shepherd king appears, you will win the victor's crown of glory that never fades away. What we see in here and, and all through the New Testament consist consistently is a plurality of leadership in every church, and that's huge. As we submit to Jesus, who is our shepherd king. And uh, my commitment to you is that I will pursue God's will for each of you with all my heart, and I'll give you 100%. And I'm just blessed and honored to be called to do this. Um, and it, it is a blessing. Now, I'm, I'm not done. That sounds like a closing comment, but it's not. Um, I, I just want to share briefly my passion and my vision personally and corporately for the church here. Um, and uh, I tried not to make it three points, but I can't help myself. It just kind of came out that way. Uh, <laughs> 
I, I just, I, you know, at this stage, it's, I, I really sense in my life, I'm 65 years old, it's no longer about me accomplishing stuff. Some of you that are younger, I mean, I, I can look, some of you older can recognize, understand what I'm talking about. When I was younger, it was all about get her done, get her done. And, you know, I'm 65 now, and, and honestly, I'm looking to future generations, and it's exciting. Guys like Brian that shared earlier to, to take what God has planted in me and multiply what I might be able to do to the next generation. And that's so much better than being a doer. Because that's what Jesus did. He took 12 guys, 12 unlikely guys, and sowed into their life for three years, and look what they did. Billions and billions of followers of Jesus are the result. And my, I just feel a passion at this this stage in my life to influence the next generation as they become the doers. Like, is Brian here? Where's Brian? You were just here. Right here. He shared. Did he leave? Oh, there you are. As Brian shared a little bit ago, we went to Spring Hills last week. I was preaching and I invited Brian to come and he just shared from his heart about his life and people were touched. There were people lined up afterwards to talk to him and I just see that. It's, a, it's an exciting time of life to, to pass the mantle on. And, and I, I'm just so excited because I know that's the vision of the church here, to committed to equip and release young leaders. We just came back from a church leadership retreat, and that was a big part of, of what we discussed. So that's the first thing I want to say, and that is to look really to, to, to the future generations and impart to them what God's imparted to me. But there's a second thing I want to mention, and that is also I'm excited about setting captives free. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus uh, stood before his home crowd in Nazareth. He quoted from the Old Testament and he talked about that the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him to set the captives free. For those who are hungry for God, there's a passion to transform lives. And one of the things I've always loved about the church here is our willingness to embrace the mess, the chaos of our humanity. Not to try to create this, you know, clean-cut, cookie Christian little, you know, cookie-cutter little perfect Christian world. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's not there. It doesn't exist. We are willing, like Jesus did, as the good shepherd, to seek out the hurting, to seek out the desperate, to seek out those that society considers outcasts. And, and I mean, for years I've been drawn to the church because of that, to be instruments of God to transform lives. And that is powerful. It's one of the things that caused me to want to be part of this church and connected with you guys. So, number one, looking to the future generations. Number two, setting the captives free. And then, thinking beyond the walls of this church. This body of people is something that is so characterized the, the, the church here for so many years to connect the leaders, the pastors, and our community in unity. Um, that's one of the, the earmarks of revival. We pray for revival. We get excited about revival. And in the, the, the blessings that God has given to me to travel, I've seen this around the world. When, when churches, God's people, come together and unite, it releases supernatural power. I've seen it in the Philippines and in India and in Uganda and Ethiopia. And, and I see it happening here. God has gifted and equipped our church to take the lead in that. And I'm grateful. You know what? I, from day one, the church here commissioned me to really work in the city as a missionary in our city, in our county, to unite churches and unite pastors. And I know the church here shares that vision. It's exciting. You know, so many churches that I, I, I connect with, I mean, it's just part of like what, what I was just talking about, by the way, just speaking at Spring Hills last week and, you know, other places. Went to the Nazarene church in a few weeks to preach. You want to go, Brian? Anyway, and so, uh, anyway, it's just opportunities. The church has blessed me to go out and do that. And I, it's just, wow, it's amazing. Because the church here has that same vision, which is not just for Santa Rosa Christian Church, but for the church in our city. Because so many churches are silos. You know what I mean? We're so concerned about our own entity, building our own kingdom, and we've got to focus on our congregation. But I've seen through the years, Santa Rosa Christian Church has a unique calling to serve the larger body of Christ. There's a kingdom mindset that's here. Some of you I met almost 25 years ago, Harry and, and a number of others, and it's just a relationship, Steve, and it's grown through the years. 
And this church, God has his hand on Santa Rosa Christian Church in such a unique way because we lead the way in this city. I'm not saying that like, well, yeah, we're right up front. No, we are leading the way. God's using us to do that in creating unity. And we still lead the way far ahead of other churches. It's, it's our DNA. You guys know what I'm talking about? And it's a blessing to be part of it. And so that's, I guess, my passion. I mean, being a preacher, I've got to have three points. And, uh, you know, to, to, to look to future generations and to set the captives free and to connect leaders together. And as we face the future, there are, I don't need to tell you, there's lots and lots and lots of challenges we face in our culture. Stuff that's going on that you go, wow, never imagined that in America. It's our congregation challenges that we're facing. But i got to tell you honestly, from the bottom of my heart, I'm more excited than ever about the possibilities. Because as the darkness increases, and we see it happening, don't we? Guess what happens? The light becomes more visible. A teacher once asked her uh, students, when can you see the furthest? And one of the kids said, uh, you know, one of the all-A students or whatever said, I, I, you know, on a bright sunny day. And she said, no. It's on a clear night. Because then you can see the stars. And they are hundreds of billions of miles away. And so as we face spiritual darkness, sometimes we despair. Sometimes we think, oh, it's, you know, things are so bad. And so, you know, really, and, and I mean, we have cause to say that sometimes. But we can shine brightly. The light becomes more visible as the darkness grows. And we want to continue to shine as we have for the past 164 years here in Sonoma County and around the world. So God, I thank you. Thank you for the privilege of calling me to serve this church. Thank you for the other men that we can stand shoulder to shoulder with, the men and the women, Lord. And God, I just declare a blessing. I, I believe, Lord, that the, as rich as our history has been, the best days lie ahead for us. Thank you for the other leaders, Lord. And we just pray a spirit of wisdom fall upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Be good now. <laughs> I'm really excited just to help out and be here with you guys. I have always felt like there's no difference between any of us. We're all serving the best we can where we are in our lives with the tools we got. And we're all the same. Like the uh, grapevine, Jesus is the vine, we're the branches. And I feel like we're all one. There isn't a us and them here. We're just a family. I, um, and, and Jesus is in each one of us. And that's super exciting to me. The other thing I'm super excited about is the community thing with other churches is when we begin to love from the heart, we had a dinner at Steve's a couple weeks ago with pastors in the area, and we stayed till late, and it was dark when we left, and we actually, the women and the other women that were there, the wives, we bonded in our hearts, and we like hugged, and we were like, oh, yeah, what's your phone number? It was like, we are friends, you know? It moved from, hi, I'm glad you're doing good, to, I love you. And so what I'm excited about with his travels and seeing revival movements happen, when they happen, they're, they're nothing like you imagine. They're miraculous, and they're out of this world. And when the, all the churches love each other, not just say they do, because we do, but you know, really do from the heart, something happens. And I feel like even the fires and everything that's going on is we're on the verge we're on the edge of something really great, and I am so excited to be a part of it. Thank you. So thank you. I guess I should have let her preach. I don't know. Hey, you guys, come back up, up here. So what I'd like to do, um, and what we'd like to do is, you hear their hearts. You guys, you guys know where they're coming. What a great gift that God's given us as a church family to have them here. And I want us to stand together based on those confessions that really you've made for us to pray over you and ask for God's kind of like to take that fire and just increase it. The revival starts here. It starts in here and us. So that, that revival would continue to break up and break out in you 
and that God would protect you and strengthen you and release in you and through you all they really want. So could I have the other, um, let's have the other elders up here? I know Dawn's gone, but in their wives. Can we come up here? Let's come around. I want you to step forward here. And let's, can you join us as we pray um, for them, over them, and to the Lord for his work with them? So. Father, we thank you for Barney and Linda. We ask, Lord, that you will uh, continue to increase the fruitfulness in their lives. We pray, Lord, that uh, Barney will be a declarer of what is good and what is right and what is righteous. Mm -hmm. We pray for Linda, Lord, that she will always see that which is of you. Mm -hmm. and that she will have a gift of discerning between uh, what is good and what is evil. Mm -hmm. We speak over this couple, Lord, and as they come into this office, we pray that you would anoint them with an authority to change the city. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for seasons of life. And this is a new season. We don't know what it holds. Uh, we know partially from what it holds because Barney and Linda are part of it. So we thank you for the season that you have for Santa Rosa Christian Church for the city of Santa Rosa. We, we step into that in faith. We embrace that. And we, we join in speaking blessing on Barney and Linda and on their part in that. We thank you that it's a communal season. It's not a season that you're calling us as individuals into, but as a community into. So we thank you for that. And we, we step into that faith and we bless you, Jesus. We bless you for Barney and Linda. Thank you. I just wanted to say something to you that I believe is from the Lord right now. Even the testimonies this morning were from people's hearts about being a light to the world. And I was reading this week, and God didn't call us to be the light of the church. He called us to be a light to the world. And that's what we're hearing from your heart. So we just commend you to the Lord. We commend you, obviously, to this body. But we stand with you that all the things he planned for you, he's put a rich base in you, but that's only a base. It's, it's like the launching pad is in your life now. May you hear and respond. May you adapt like Linda said. It never comes in the ways you expect. So that you will be that light that he has ordained for you since before time began. Father, we again um, express to you our gratefulness that you brought them to our church. And Father, we thank you that their lips have praised you their whole married life, I think. And that they really are um, ones that testify that great is your faithfulness. I thank you, Lord, that we need them and that they need us, that you have in um, your plan to join us together. We thank you that I've had the fruit of both of them, and um, my faith has been increased as a result of who they are. Father, we thank you that your mercies are new each day and each morning. We just pray a hedge of protection upon them, that they would um, be guarded from the enemy, and that you would use this season in their life to multiply even more. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, all of us together have given witness to the word, but also to their lives. Lord, we've, we've made our mark on a paper, but we've made our mark in the heavens. We agree with the courts of heaven. We say yes and amen to the life that's within them and that's a life that's found in all of us, Lord. Have your way, have your will. Let the heavens pour down upon them, through them, for your glory now. In Jesus' name, we all say amen. 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 Thank you, guys.